Welcome to Super Nutrition Academy's health class with your host and registered holistic nutritionist, Uriel Kame. Tune in each week for up-to-date insights on breaking health news and best practices on how to eat for awesome health. It's time to get smarter, healthier, and regain your sanity in a world of information overload. And don't forget to join Yuri at supernutritionacademy.com so you too can master your nutrition and health. Hey guys, how's it going? Yuri Al came here. I've got a very special treat for you today because we have the man behind the Bulletproof Executive, Bulletproof Coffee, and a bunch of other awesome biohacking, body hacking strategies and tools, Mr. Dave Asprey himself with me on the line. And I'm, in case you're not familiar with who Dave, Dave Asprey is, I'm, I'm just first of all going to point you back to his website, which is bulletproofexec.com. And I, I think the website will do a much better job at <laughs> giving him a really good background more than I can. But essentially, Dave, is, he specializes in figuring out how to hack the human body to, for it to perform better. Uh, he has a high-end coaching practice where he coaches high-end entrepreneurs and business people to get more out of them themselves. He's spent a quarter of a million dollars on himself in terms of figuring like all sorts of cool brain hacking type of tests. And also maybe he'll talk about this during the interview at some point. Uh, he's you know gone from 100 pounds overweight to a healthy weight, doing all these cool, wicked stuff, uh, different strategies. And uh, again, I asked him before this, I'm like, how do I even introduce you? I'm not even sure, but he's he's an awesome guy. And the reason I wanted to bring him on to the episode today is because I think we're all in the same game of improving our performance, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you're a pro athlete, whether you're somebody who just works nine to five and just wants to make it through the day. I think we're all in the same game of wanting to enjoy our day-to-day experience that much more. And I think what Dave is doing and is going to hopefully share with us uh, in, in this podcast to some degree will we'll give you some really cool insights into that. But obviously, we'll be talking about some recent health news as well. So uh, without any further ado... Welcome, Dave. Thanks a ton. I'm happy to be on the show, Yuri. Yeah, it's it's going to be great. So, um, I was just mentioning to you earlier that I was just trying out, or you were mentioning, if anyone's listening and has heard of Bulletproof Coffee, you've probably somehow from somewhere heard of this. I actually heard of Bulletproof Coffee before I even knew Dave. Uh, this is like probably a year and a half ago, everyone's like talking about bulletproof coffee and just yeah, adding some butter and coconut oil and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, this is pretty cool. So just some really awesome stuff that you're doing. And you were actually really nice enough to send me a package of your new bulletproof upgraded coffee. And I have to say, I don't drink coffee that often, but when I do, I sound like the most interesting man in the world commercial here for a second. <laughs> um, so when I do drink coffee, it's decaf. And he, so he sent me a pack of decaf and I just told him, I'm like, dude, this is like the best coffee I've had like I don't even I don't even know if there's any com- kind of comparison I can make to that. So, yeah, you're doing a ton of awesome stuff with coffee. Maybe we can talk about that near the uh, as as we kind of go through this. But anyways, I'll let you kind of take it. Um, is there anything else you want to add to the intro that I kind of skimmed over? I, I think you hit it pretty well. You know, yeah. hacking your coffee, hacking your body, it all goes together. Yeah, and and just also from a credibility perspective, guys, he's been featured in pretty much every single news outlet, all the big media, Rolling Stone magazine, all like L.A. Times, Financial Times, the whole bit. Um, so needless to say, like Dave is is pretty pretty well versed in this stuff. So you were mentioning earlier that there was something that came across your desk about uh, TMAO and red meats that was uh, just in the was it New York Times you mentioned? Yeah, New York Times and Forbes both had these short articles saying. It's an amazing new study, and it shows that red meat causes cancer. And this is one of those things, like, it seems every six months someone writes something like that. And this was a – it got a ton of press, but I dug in on it as as a biohacker and was kind of dismayed when, when I went in. So given that this was a very high-profile thing and it is part of the ongoing red meat scare, it might be useful for people – hearing our conversation to get sort of the biohackers angle on the news stories and what the study actually said versus what the headlines said. Does that yeah. work for you? Absolutely. So this article that came out basically said that 
Red meat causes heart disease because a chemical called TMAO, which is trimethylamine N oxide for the four biochemist people who are probably listening to this, <laughs> um, what is it called TMAO? Uh, that this goes up, which goes in your bloodstream, and it could increase the risk of heart disease. And the study itself, when you dig in, says that if you have disordered bacteria in your gut, then you can get TMAO, which can give you heart disease. And it's funny how the headline said this is a red meat thing, but it got much deeper than that. So the logic in this study said something like, you know, red meat has an amino acid called L-carnitine. And mm -hmm. if you're a biohacker, you probably know L-carnitine is you know, good for muscles, good for brain function in the acetylated form. And basically, like, acetyl L-carnitine is one of the oldest smart nutrients known for brain function. So anyway, this is present in red meat, which is one of the reasons red meat's good for you, by the way. Uh, gut bacteria only found in people who eat red meat use carnitine as part of their fuel. And when they do that, they make TMAO. And then we kind of sort of think, well, we don't have evidence that TMAO helps cholesterol get into artery walls. Therefore, TMAO is, is the problem. Mm -hmm. So one of the things in the study they did is they measured industrial meat. This is typical red meat in the U.S., which is where the study was done. And we have these things called CAFO, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, where the animals are fed antibiotics, things that change gut bacteria. And these antibiotics uh, change the quality of the meat. So when you eat meat from an antibacteria-treated cow, you change your gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. The researchers also didn't measure the presence of antibiotic residue in the meat yet they're looking at gut flora. So what they've done is they've introduced this huge variable but not looked at it and then made that part of the conclusion of the study. Um, they also um, basically used barbecuing techniques, which are known to create nitrosamines, which are well known from barbecuing. And we've all heard you know, barbecuing your meat increases cancer risk. Well, that's yep. funny. They're blaming red meat even though they burned the red meat, which is another variable that they didn't measure or control for. Mm -hmm. And they also, in the study, said, oh, by the way, uh, TMAO is formed from lots of things, including vegetables, because like celery is full of nitrite, and choline, which comes from soy or from egg yolks even. So they're somehow saying red meat's the culprit, even though most foods make this in the gut, depending on what's in your gut, what's growing there. And the final part is they used an assumption about the cause of heart disease based on TMAO and the arteries without any evidence. So we had basically an interesting scientific exploration in a study that had some very obvious holes, but it, the headlines all said red meat causes cancer. Mm -hmm. So this problem about, you know, where did meat come from is something that I don't I don't, as a biohacker, particularly enjoy the fact that when I go to a restaurant, I don't order the red meat, even though I think red meat's really good for you. And the reason I don't do that is almost all red meat, unless you're buying it at a grass-fed restaurant or you're cooking it at home, is made from animals that were incredibly poorly fed and incredibly poorly treated. And I feel different. My brain works differently when I eat poor quality meat versus good quality meat. So when a study says red meat does something, the answer is red meat from what cows, fed what, preserved how, and cooked how. And when you follow that entire chain, the system of getting meat into your body, you start thinking about a study that says red meat does something as a very different thing than, uh, you know, just one isolated incident. The red meat on your plate came from somewhere, and that variable is a bigger thing than most people imagine. Yeah, and I think, like, even... Even above and beyond the, um, the TMAO issue, I think the bigger issue is is how they're conducting these research studies, because I was I was just uh, putting together some information on multivitamins the other day and going through a lot of the research, like the the quality of of, of what they're subjecting people to is is very suspicious. I mean, in this case, obviously, I, I don't know of any studies that are that are feeding subjects grass fed meats, right? I mean, I think the results would be very different. And with multivitamins, for instance, there was a big uh, physician's health study that looked at 14,000 male doctors, and they found that multivitamins, uh, little if at all, kind of reduced their mortality from cancer. And the study was funded by Pfizer, and the, the, 
the multivitamins that they were using was uh, was Centrum, which is produced by Pfizer, and Centrum is one of the worst quality multivitamins on the market. Um, so, I mean, like, obviously, if they used a whole food multivitamin, it may have been different, but I think, like, what you're talking about here is it really, even above and beyond the issue of the meat, I mean, it brings up this, or the TMAO and heart disease and so forth, it just brings up this whole notion of, like, uh, so much of the science now is just so, like, suspicious. I mean, it's, I don't know if it has the same objectivity or even the same pull as, as it used to. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't know. What do you think about that? There's a lot of, of, of mixing of industry and science, and there are very well done uh, analyses out there that show like 75% of studies funded by uh, a company end up showing that the company's products work. Mm-hmm. So hmm, I, it, it, it's hard to say. And I think that the counterpoint on that the study I'm thinking of also showed that uh, when you removed the that are funded by companies, some, it was roughly like 50-50. So there's a clear bias that happens. And what, what bothers me here on the study of something like Centrum, uh, which is, is actually in, in some hospitals they call Centrum uh, a bedpan bullet, because it doesn't even like digest, yeah. like comes out the other end. Uh, so, like to say, oh, therefore multivitamins don't work. Well, it, it's sort of like saying, well, you know, I took uh, I took aspirin for my my whatever heart attack uh, risk, and I still got a heart attack. Therefore, drugs don't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like each multivitamin is different, and you know, I I formulate some very high-end supplements uh, for my upgraded self line. So I'm, I'm on the phone with, you know, biochemists and, you know, working on novel forms of things. And I tell you, it is not the same as, oh, you know, this vitamin that you bought at, you know, at Walgreens or somewhere um, is the same as this other vitamin that was, like, like you said, made from Whole Foods or that has a novel delivery mechanism. And, when I started my path of biohacking about 15 years ago, yeah, I weighed 300 pounds. And yeah, I took a cheap multi because I'm like, well, it seems like a good idea. But as I got more involved in the anti-aging field, and it turns out now I'm the chairman of the Silicon Valley Health Institute, uh, an anti-aging group that's been around for 20 years, um, having you know, public talks about this stuff, uh, I realized that the quality of your supplements is just as important as the quality of your food. And I mm-hmm. eventually got to the point where I started making my own stuff because I couldn't buy... Uh, some of the things that I wanted to get, you know, I, I couldn't get the level of purity or quality. And when I took the cheap stuff, it didn't work. Like my brain wasn't as sharp as it should be. And given all the neurofeedback and things I've done, I tend to be a pretty good guinea pig there because I can feel a slight decline in cognitive performance and I can trace it back to something in my environment or in my supplements or in my food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that's one way of doing it to kind of just restructure the whole industry and take it into your own hands, which is uh, which is awesome. And uh, just in case you guys are interested in uh, some of the stuff Dave's talking about, you can check it out at UpgradeSelf.com. And Upgrade you can check out... Oh, sorry. Up, yes, UpgradeSelf.com. And check out uh, a lot of the cool stuff that, uh, that he's putting out, which is obviously top quality. So when... Like when you see this kind of news come up in New York Times or other big media outlets, like what kind of advice do you give to the everyday person to say, like, how, how do you, I mean, what is the what is the kind of average person supposed to do when they see this kind of stuff? Like, what kind of advice would you kind of give to them? Don't take nutrition advice from large magazines mm-hmm. or large newspapers yeah. because they're looking for sensationalist headlines. And it's not that hard to go back and read at least a good summary of the research. And what I found in the course of, of beginning this whole, this whole thing was that I could, I could eventually figure out which voices I trusted. So there are you know, functional anti-aging medicine physicians where I could call one of these guys and say, what do you think? And they'd tell me. And after a while, you find that there are some people who write things that are generally trustworthy and there are others who sort of like promulgate the latest. And what I recommend people do is be uh, be conscious of your information sources, just like you should be conscious of the sources of your meat or your vegetables. Mm-hmm. And an excess of information that's low quality is just like eating junk food. So you can have junk light in your office with fluorescent lights. You can have junk food 
in your diet, and you can have junk information. So pay attention to where the info comes from, and as good a news source as the New York Times or Forbes may be, as a source of nutrition or lifestyle information, neither one um, really is going to do it because they're not looking at that as their goal. Their goal is readership. Whereas when you look at someone who has a certain scientific perspective that you agree with that seems to work for you, then look at what they have to say about your nutrition and health, and you'll find it's very different than what the mainstream media tells you about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I often tell my clients, don't eat anything that's advertised on TV. And then you could also apply that to magazines or, or a lot of other stuff as well. Because uh, unfortunately, you know, if you're watching, if you're watching Jeopardy, for instance, the one of the the most common ads will be for Centrum multivitamin. <laughs> so it's just like that's that's not going to happen. Um, I just uh, I just totally lost my uh, my train of thought for a moment. Um, so with respect to uh, and and you know I mean obviously having been published and featured in all these different sources of media I mean you know how it works. I mean, they're always looking for a new angle, new content to fill space. Uh, so they're always looking for the latest little hook. And and even this is something that I found with Dr. Oz is that I think initially him being on TV, having his own show is great in terms of getting this kind of alternative health message out there. But what I've found as of late is that he's on five days a week for an hour, you know, at a time. And that's a lot of content they need to fill. So now they're just bringing in whatever they can to fill the space. And I found that the perhaps the quality or the integrity of the message has been diminished, and you know perhaps it's misleading a lot of people. You know, I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't pick on on Dr. Oz. Uh, you know, he's uh, he's done an awful lot to get an enormous number of people to pay attention to this, mm-hmm. and you know, all media people. I mean, including you and me. I mean, you're you're working on a book. Uh, you know, I, I have my my podcast and my blog and all that. And uh, like the other day, I realized a half a million people a month are reading my blog. Like I am, I am the media, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of astonishing, to be perfectly honest, because that wasn't really really where I set out to go there. So people will also say the same thing about you and me that oh, you know, they they started you know selling books, you know they're there are sellouts and, and things like that. And I, I wouldn't go that far with Dr. Oz. I think his, his heart's in the right place. He's working on getting new info out there. It is incredibly difficult to do great due diligence on five new technologies a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, he must have a really big research team um, because I know the amount of research that you know it took me to write the article I just wrote about uh, red meat and, and heart disease and TMAO. And if I had to do one of those every day, I think my eyes would cross and I'd fall over. So, um, you know, I'm sure that's a part of, you know, the Dr. Oz life. It's like, how do I, you know, how do I balance the science I want to do with the needs of keeping this entertaining for people? It's got to be an amazing challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, he has done a great job and I think it's, it's, we're better off for having him on TV because he is really bringing a good message. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see, and like obviously, for the most part, I think most of the stuff they have on there is greater. But it's interesting to see sometimes how, you know, it's um, it's interesting to kind of step, you know, take a step back and look at from from a marketing perspective how they how they do things, which is uh, which is always interesting. Obviously, being an entrepreneur and a marketer myself, but uh, but nonetheless, he he obviously does uh, a lot of good. So let's uh, let's shift gears for a little bit. Let's talk about some of the stuff that you do with kind of bulletproofing your body, hacking your body, what are some, some cool, what are some, let's say, three ways that the everyday person who is health interested can, can take advantage of some cool little tricks or tactics that you've learned over the last couple of years to enhance their brain function or, or how they get through their days? The top recommendation here is bulletproof coffee. And before you roll your eyes and go, oh, my God, if this guy's trying to shill his own stuff, it, it's a recipe I'm talking about here. Yeah. Um, what, what it is is you need coffee beans that don't have mold toxins in them, low mycotoxin coffee. I, I have bulletproof processed coffee. That is something that I sell. Um, I also, on the website, tell people how to find coffee that's probably kind of low in toxin because mm-hmm. if you drink, like, the average coffee you buy at a corner coffee shop, 
those beans contain detectable levels of mycotoxins that affect your, your mood levels throughout the day. You drink coffee, then you crash. You drink coffee, then you crash. If you get mold-free coffee, you drink coffee, and then you land and you feel like yourself again, but you don't crash. So you need good quality coffee like that. Um, I recommend my upgraded coffee. You need grass-fed butter. Again, where it comes from is, is what makes the key for your performance. Uh, Kerrygold Irish Butter works, and there's various organic brands you can find um, of grass-fed butter. And then something called medium-chain triglyceride oil. Um, I have that on upgraded self. I, I manufacture one. This is an extract of coconut that's six times stronger than coconut oil. It provides a direct source of energy, different from carbohydrates and different from normal long-chain fats. It has no flavor, and it's liquid at room temperature. So what you do is you take your brewed coffee, toss in some grass-fed butter, toss in some MCT oil, and you blend it. And blending is actually important for the way it works. If you try this in the morning for breakfast and you don't eat any carbs and probably not even any protein, you're going to feel this huge burst of energy. You will have a complete lack of hunger for about six hours. When I say lack of hunger, someone can set a bagel in front of you at 10 a.m. when you normally crash, and you look at the bagel with zero desire in your heart. You just don't care because you don't want to eat because you're full and because your body got what it needed. And your brain is focusing like you've never really focused before because butter and other compounds in that drink affect inflammation in the brain. So this is like a carefully designed biohacker recipe to make coffee that totally, totally just like changes your day. And there's hundreds of thousands of people who do this on a regular basis. So for, uh, for the individual, for instance, like me, I don't drink caffeine. Uh, obviously, I've, I've had your decaf coffee, which is awesome. So the quality of, in and of itself is awesome. So if, again, I'm not personally endorsing coffee consumption, I'll just be fully outright. But I think if you're going to drink coffee, you might as well do it properly and drink the right beans and, and with obviously the right formulation. And if you're a coffee drinker, try this out because the flavor alone is worth trying it for. And obviously, if you enjoy these kind of um, cognitive benefits, that's that's an added plus. So Let's say somebody comes to you and says, okay, well, I don't drink coffee and I don't drink coffee. What, what's something else that they could do? Well, then decaf is a good way to go. And if you do a research, uh, a study, on, or, sorry, a search on Google of mm -hmm. coffee and heart disease or coffee and cancer or coffee and diabetes, uh, you'll find amazing studies out there. Um, so I, I've learned to look at, at my daily single cup of coffee in the morning as um, – something that I, I do that, that's like a, an herbal preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I even create my coffee brewing process like an herbal tincture because um, I, I get benefits from it. So it, it's not, you know, it, it's not a, an, a bad thing in order to have a cup of coffee on a daily basis. In fact, my beans are much lower in caffeine than typical coffee, even though you get a really big boost from them. Uh, and that Lower in caffeine happens because when a coffee plant is less stressed, it makes less caffeine. And caffeine is one of the ways the plant protects itself from insects and from, from molds and things like that. So it's a fascinating process how it all comes together and how what goes into your cup, really what matters most is what happened before the coffee was roasted. Then you want to have a good quality roast and all that. So it, it's kind of funny. But let's say that you, you just flat out aren't going to do it. Maybe you have a caffeine metabolizing uh, genome that tells you not to do that. Then you can do it with, with tea. It doesn't taste as well, as good as coffee, but uh, green tea or white tea, not black tea, would be the way to go. And lately, uh, I've been doing uh, something which is a recipe that's going up on the blog soon. It's this uh, form of vanilla, vanilla is another big problem for mold because it's a bean that dries. And so during the drying process, it usually molds. Um, I have a, a low mycotoxin processed vanilla. It's just a straight vanilla powder. I take a whole teaspoon of vanilla powder, which is quite a lot. I throw it in a blender with hot water, butter, and MCT oil. And I blend that um, sometimes with some sweetener. And oh my God, that is a delicious drink. It's, mm. it's like creamy and foamy like you'd expect a latte to be. Um, and it's got like amazing vanilla overtones and just a hint of sweetness from xylitol usually. And in fact, I had that this morning instead of uh, my normal cup of bulletproof coffee. Um, so that's a recipe I've just been perfecting in the last few weeks for people who want zero caffeine. And mm -hmm. vanilla itself started out as, um, you know, as an herb before it was a spice. It was actually used um, for um, 
like alertness and uh, as an aphrodisiac, believe it or not. Hmm. So it's uh, it's kind of a cool, it's got a cool history that I wrote about a while back. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm a big fan of green smoothies and green juices, and I remember seeing on your site you're talking about uh, this this kale shake. And can you describe that because it's it's kind of you're talking about obviously the goitrogenic and the oxalic acid properties of of kale and leafy greens, and then how to kind of circumvent that to really maximally benefit from the kale and and how you can just kind of describe that that shape that you're mentioning. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. You know, kale has become this new superfood, but when you we start looking at everything as a system. What you find is that the kale itself, there's different varieties of kale with very different biological effects. So like the curly kale, you know, with lots mm-hmm. of little frilly lacy leaves, has a lot more oxalic acid than dinosaur kale, which has the longer, flatter leaves and a little bit bumpy, like you would imagine a dinosaur skin would be. Mm-hmm. So one of the first things to do is, if you're going to be eating your kale, particularly raw, is you really owe it to yourself to find dinosaur kale, not the, the curly kale. And you can cut your TM, or your uh, levels of oxalic acid quite substantially that way. So you go through and you find the right stuff. And then if you eat raw or if you juice your kale raw, you're getting a lot of oxalic acid. And people don't really uh, think about oxalic acid much, but it's a major component of these crystals that form in the body, kind of like ones from gout, which is uric acid. But when you get oxalic acid, free oxalic acid from the diet in the body, it goes in and it binds with calcium where it finds calcium. And then it forms tiny little crystals that cause muscle weakness and pain. And there's even a group of people looking at it in connection with autism. One of the more alarming conditions that uh, oxalic acid contributes to is one called vulvodynia. This is uh, a cause of painful sex in women. And what uh, researchers believe is happening there is that tiny oxalic acid crystals form in the vagina. And when that happens, it burns and it hurts. So this is pretty terrible if you're doing a kale shake or a kale smoothie, and over time you build up high levels of oxalic acid in the body, it's going to cause systemic problems. I I blogged about the whole list of problems there. So what do you do about it? Well, number one, don't eat your kale raw. Historically, we've never eaten kale raw because of this problem. What you do to make it useful as as a food group for humans and safe for long-term consumption is you boil it or at least steam it and drain the liquid. Just pour it out. And people say, oh, no, I might lose some vitamins. Yeah, you'll lose a few vitamins. You'll also lose about two-thirds of the oxalic acid in it, which is really important. And you won't lose that many vitamins because a lot of the vitamins stay in the kale. Hmm. From there, you take your kale that you've cooked and toss it in a, in a blender is the recipe that I'm talking about. And add some butter, which makes the vitamins in it much more available. Add some MCT oil if you want that extra energy boost. That's how I do it. Uh, and then you blend it. And when you do that, add a little bit of calcium and magnesium to it. And now this sounds like, are you serious? Like, I just wanted to eat my kale. But here's the thing. It's not that hard to toss a little bit of calcium in with the blender. The oxalic acid that's left in that kale will bind to the calcium in the blender, and then you won't absorb it because it'll be already bound and you'll excrete it when you eat it. If, however, you take that stuff without calcium and you eat it, it'll enter your system and it'll have to bind to calcium somewhere else and you can have this problem. So if you do it the way I'm talking about, you get a delicious kale hot soup that honestly tastes better than your green kale smoothie. You get the vitamins that are highly absorbable because they had fat, and you get zero effective oxalic acid in your body. This is a long-term way of reducing toxins in food, but still getting all the nutrients, and it tastes really good. That's an example of like the system of food and how it affects the body. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really cool strategy in terms of putting the calcium slash magnesium into the blender, um, because you're benefiting from the the fact that it impairs absorption, which is, you know, in this case, what we'd want, which is actually really cool. So that's uh, that's a really cool recommendation. I, I call um, it calcium loading. Uh, calcium loading. And it, yeah. it's important, even if you're going to do it raw, which I honestly don't recommend on a regular basis for any of the cruciferous vegetables, knowing what they do to your thyroid, mm-hmm. um, you should add a little bit of calcium carbonate and magnesium oxide to it. Um, those are the cheapest, most available, mo- the cheapest, uh, like most 
sold forms of calcium and magnesium. They're also the least available for use in the human body. They're not great mm-hmm. supplements, but yeah. they're good at reacting with oxalic acid in your food. Yeah, that's that's a really that's a that's a very cool recommendation. Um, yeah, I, I I guarantee not a lot of people have, have have thought of that, including myself, until you mentioned it. So that's definitely something I will I will add into my smoothies. Very cool. All right. Um, so just before we finish off, is there is there anything else you want to leave our our, our listeners with? Another cool tip, um, maybe outside of the nutrition space, maybe something um, uh, brain hacking wise that you've discovered yeah. in your in your journeys. Here's another one. Um, I'm, I do a lot of work with uh, like hedge fund traders and uh, CEO types who are really, uh, really just high performance, but also high stress. Mm-hmm. And almost all of them have a hard time going to sleep at night. It, it's, it's a known mm-hmm. thing. It, one of my big areas of focus is sleep quality. Like I, I went on less than five hours of sleep per night for two years straight as part of an experiment, and I can totally perform well on that. In fact, some of my biomarkers even improved. So number one recommendation that I make for improving sleep is sleep dark. This means that particularly if you live in a city, hang a heavy blanket over your window or invest in some really nice blackout shades and curtains. And blackout means exactly that. When they're closed, you cannot tell if it's day or night outside. Mm-hmm. And then go through your room and systematically put black tape over every LED, especially the blue and green ones. Because even a little bit of green LED from that smoke detector changes your melatonin secretion. So people who have a hard time sleeping do this, and all of a sudden they sleep the whole night through. So it's amazing what a little bit of light does. Even wearing a sleep mask doesn't necessarily fix the problem. Because your uh, your skin is sensitive to light, and we've got a, a neat study out there that shows that you know, when people get light on their skin, that it changes their sleep pattern. So you need to be in the dark, make it happen, and you will sleep much better. Awesome, yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion as well, because we can all use better sleep. It's not necessarily about the length of the sleep; it's about the quality of the sleep. So that's that's, that's I mean, that's so you went five hours a night for two years. Sometimes I was only doing two hours a night, yeah. During that time, I also <laughs> ate 4,000 calories a day, and I stopped exercising and lost weight. I bet. Um, huh. That was a pretty amazing little – I thought I would do it for two months. I was going to gain you know, two pounds and say, look, I should have gained 20 pounds according to the math. Calories are a scam. But I did not expect that in two years I would grow a six-pack and uh, basically get more muscular and lean and have this huge, amazing amounts of energy. But that's what happened. So, yeah, it, it was reduced – much reduced sleep, uh, as well as an increased caloric consumption of very high fat, very high quality calories. Mm, That's awesome. I should have weighed 616 pounds at the end of that experiment. I didn't. So, oops. Well, that's what's cool about the stuff that you're doing is that it's very, in a lot of cases, um, opposite to a commonly held beliefs about what is possible or what is healthy. And you're you're kind of opening up the, the, the discussion now saying, okay, well, actually, you know what, this actually could be better for you. Which, which I believe is what science should be doing, you know, in terms of all these scientific studies. It's not telling us that sugar is going to cause diabetes because we all know that, but actually doing these kind of experiments, which I think are, are pretty awesome. So uh, for all of our listeners, um, if you want to follow more of Dave's shenanigans and, and awesomeness, then uh, check out his blog again. It's at bulletproofexec.com. Uh, there's a ton of awesome information out there. He does a lot of research on everything he puts out. And uh, you can learn a lot more about him and what he's up to at the blog. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Is there anything else you want to finish off with before we end? Um, Yeah, one quick plug, if you don't mind. Yeah. If you are interested in having uh, a healthy pregnancy or uh, fertility, check out uh, betterbabybook.com, which is a book that my wife and I uh, just wrote and published in January about what you can do then using these kinds of techniques. Hmm, nice. Betterbabybook.com. Yep. Thanks, Yuri. Awesome. Have an awesome day. Yeah, thank you, Dave, and thanks for all of our listeners, and we'll see you guys in the next episode.